Anyway, and Paul and met Malcolm at uh, some TV things, and then how he was invited to uh, Elijah Muhammad's um, uh, house in South Chicago, uh, and then um, how when he came in, he found him to be a little completely charming person, and he unifies this story, even though it's very sort of you know, fly with your seat of the pants kind of a, a book here, just whatever is coming to his head, he's writing. Um, and he compares it to when he was a little boy and met the uh, preacher woman who basically turned him into a really interesting person. And um, he saw that on page 64. What he saw in Malcolm X, uh, Elijah's face, was this feeling that lift the burdens off my shoulder, take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. The central quality of Elijah's face is pain. The smile is a witness to pain so old and deep and black that it becomes personal. And uh, he turned me with a smile saying something like, I've got a lot to say to you, but we'll wait till we sit down. Uh, so he actually likes uh, 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 Elijah, doesn't he? And I don't get the impression that he liked Malcolm at all, but he doesn't really dwell much on Malcolm. And, um, you know, they have made Malcolm into a big hero for everybody, and he may be heroic. I mean, I'm not saying he isn't, but here's a, a person who's fairly sensitive. Maybe he just likes uh, Elijah because he's such a delicate fellow. And as you see, he is a very, uh, you know, uh, gentle sort of, uh, very quite civilized uh, sort of individual, you know, regardless of his um, perceived behavior. I mean, um, liking women among men is not an odd phenomenon. Uh, if that were an odd phenomenon, there wouldn't be any humans left in this universe. So uh, I don't think that's uh, such a strange behavior pattern. Um, maybe uh, taking advantage of your power is not an admirable thing, but uh, a lot of people take advantage of their power. In any event, um, that may have been a weakness, uh, as old as the Garden of Eden, shall we say. But um, aside from that, he's a very well-mannered, self-effacing, very um, cultured person, it seems. And I think perhaps meeting Malcolm X would be a more aggressive kind of person, a much more um, tough, uh, you know, someone who'd been on the streets and knew the way of the streets and survived these streets and survived prison. So, you know, regardless of the fact that Malcolm has eclipsed Elijah, I think in this book, Elijah eclipses Malcolm. Now, none of us probably even know what Elijah Muhammad represented, but I think he actually represented a combination of Christianity and Islam. I don't think it was pure Islam, and it wasn't certainly pure Christianity. You know, trying to amalgamate different religions, if you like, into a cult type situation. Um, I recently was invited to hear the Reverend Moon by someone who was a follower of Reverend Moon. And I went up to Los Angeles, I didn't really want to go and have the time, but this person dragged me up there, so I, I ultimately had to go. I couldn't be totally rude and, you know, to this person who was a family, distant family member of, of, uh, of mine, related to me. This person was groping. And I have to say, I mean, I was quite impressed by Reverend Moon in terms of the, the um, chemistry he had with his uh, followers. You know, there was a, just a mob of different people there of all different races and backgrounds, and when Reverend Moon came in and started talking, and they were totally uh, in his thrall. So these people do have a magnetic uh, attraction. I mean, I, what he was talking about was fairly harmless stuff. He basically was talking about having 
Well, he wanted to marry everybody and mix all of the races and stuff. But he was basically wanted people to take care of their families, have children, uh, be good fathers and mothers once he'd married them, be faithful and so on. And that was what his lecture was about. Yeah. That's Reverend Sung Yeah, that's who it is. <laughs> Does it matter what his first name is? <laughs> well, that's what you're talking about. Are there more than one Reverend Moons around? I didn't know, yeah. He isn't. He's his own denomination. He's a moody. <laughs> but I, the reason I bring him up because I think he's very similar to Elijah Muhammad in, in many ways in terms of, of what his effect on his uh, on his following is, what that would have been then. And uh, also the things that uh, he's been, seemed to be encouraging in this crowd of people was the same kind of. Uh, family values, uh, and so on, only he wants to mix all the races together in a final uh, melting pot thing, which is why he marries everyone, uh, different races and things, to get them all mixing up, and uh, so on and so forth. So, I mean, I'm not advocating his approach, but I could see them, I was quite surprised that this guy could talk for three hours to a huge audience of about three or four thousand people and not stop and even though he was about 85 years old, and they would all listen and told like spellbound. I could see the faces of the people who were totally like spellbound. And, uh, I get a picture that Elijah Muhammad probably could do the same thing. So these people uh, do have a certain, uh, uh, I guess you'd call it charisma, would that be the right word? And their followers are um, overwhelmed by their persona. And then when they, disappear from the scene, things seem to uh, fall away. So it does depend on their personality a lot. And, uh, so we don't know anything about Elijah Muhammad, most people anymore, because he's disappeared. And uh, only Malcolm X has basically left a legacy because of the sad events that uh, centered around his life and the fact that he was more militant and he uh, was more out there in the public scene and, you know, saw in the uh, Spike Lee movie uh, all the news reels about him and so on. And I think um, the idea of conspiracy and the death of Malcolm X is a little perhaps overblown. I mean there were certainly assassinations we already spoke about it in the 60s going on that uh, were very ugly and uh, I'm sure a lot of people were. done away with by uh, surreptitious forces in this country of a, not a very um, honorable kind, and pretty ugly, let us say. But I think there would be enough competition within the movement that Malcolm came from to have um, certainly been a large part of whatever occurred there because of his tendency to grab the headlines and take away the membership for his part of things. And uh, we know the people who took over the movement after him were his opponents. I know this gentleman here probably doesn't quite agree with what I'm saying, but... I have yet. No, go ahead. Have your... No, he doesn't dare make that statement. What, what did I say? Well, I said there was enough uh, opposition within this movement. There was so much in conspiracy. Not so much as in other, in, in, I mean, there was enough people within the movement who had the axe to grind against him. Same thing with Martin Luther King? No, I don't. Well, I don't think people within Martin Luther King movement wanted to uh, get rid of him. There were people. Okay. I mean, well, the same thing last time you said about, oh, he switched to Islam a more uh, fundamentals or more idealistic Islam for economic reasons. Oh, I, I think yeah, yeah, you're simplifying everything I said. I'm just saying, that's, that's uh, what I, 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 I If you hear only the worst part of what you're thinking I'm saying, you don't hear the breadth of what I'm saying. That there were economic factors, and I'm saying just switched to Orthodox Islam because of economic factors. There certainly were economic factors that were a positive part of the switch. He benefited much more from going down the mainstream than he uh, would have done just uh, as head of a, a local uh, a cult. There's a lot of money coming out of the oil company. You don't think so? I don't know. Oh, you don't know. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, Yasser Arafat, uh, he didn't have huge bank accounts as a, as a as a leader of the Palestine Liberation Movement. 
and uh, you don't think that there was a lot of money pouring in from all kinds of sources uh, in order to be this uh, aggressive figure that he was willing to be? I wouldn't compare it to. No, I'm not, I'm not comparing it to. I'm saying, don't you think that people of that uh, kind, in terms of leaders of a movement, get a lot of support from a lot of money sources that they wouldn't otherwise have long? Anyway, I don't want to argue personally with you, and I don't mean to hurt your feelings. Uh, you know, um, you have your feeling. I'm trying to show that only by my comments that Elijah Muhammad isn't this horrible person that uh, he's being made out to be, according to James Paul. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and also, I'm trying to think, I don't think James Paul would have liked Malcolm X because of the aggressive militant style. Uh, I think you agree with that. In other words, in the Afro-American community, and I'm not an expert, and you probably know more about it than I do, I think there are fault lines and splits that are not perceivable, particularly always to people outside of that community. I mean, uh, to go back to the black Muslim movement, and I, I don't want to throw out modern names, but the only one that people really are familiar with now is Louis Farrakhan. I do agree with that. I imagine Louis Farrakhan and uh, Malcolm X uh, were, if not on the same wavelength, they may have been on the same wavelength, because I think Louis Farrakhan has moved in the direction of Malcolm X in the way he has uh, uh, presented the movement. Uh, and in fact, Elijah Muhammad's offspring, I think, to some extent, have been shunted aside in, in his leadership, although some are alive with him from what I've been able to perceive. But I think that uh, they would have been competitors They're not pussycats. <laughs> I wouldn't want to get up on the other side of Louis Farrakhan, put it that way. Uh, so I, that's all I'm trying to say. Sure, there may have been conspiracies. And uh, I acknowledge to you the conspiracies and all the things that went on, particularly the Black Panthers. Now, if you say there's conspiracies about the Black Panthers, I 100% agree with you. And, uh, the Ma and the Martin Luther King, 100%. Uh, I would agree with you 100%, but I only think that there's enough uh, um, um, uh, feeling within the movement to also, uh, we know the people who supposedly did this, I mean, they were the people who were uh, found with the weapons and did the firing, were people within the movement. You would agree with that, at least. They weren't. Well, who were they? They were, weren't they, weren't they Afro-Americans? So they're Afro-Americans, they were from the movement. Okay, I, I can't go any further on that one. <laughs> I mean, the CIA and the FBI must be pretty effective if they can uh, take Afro-Americans and have them um, kill somebody and be willing to spend the rest of their time, life in, in um, prison, et cetera, for having done things of that kind just to uh, help out the CIA it doesn't seem to me to be a reasonable uh, 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 Have you ever heard of COINTELPRO? We went in through, uh, we went in a little bit to the Manchurian candidates in Rome. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. What are you talking about? The COINTELPRO, the CIA, or the FBI, kind of domestic policy of undermining the political figures. Yeah, well, we know about that. We know, uh, we know what happened under J. Edgar Hoover. It stopped in the 70s. Now in the yeah, 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 we know all that. We're not denying that. Oh, I'm just saying that that was the program already. Wait, 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 man. You still have to get people who are willing to go and do such things to spend the rest of their time in prison. I can't. What? They're, they're not powerful. All right. Look, so, somebody did what you say because here's these guys that did it and are spending the rest of their life. I don't know what sentence they got, I have to admit. I don't okay. know if they've been let out the back door or what. Like, these people that did it, whether they did it for, for Elijah Muhammad or did it for the CIA, somebody did convince them to do that. All right. I agree with all you guys on these matters, but I honestly think that there was enough antagonism within the movement to bring about this kind of hostility. And look, we know that uh, Malcolm X's uh, uh, children blame people within the movement. Now, you can say they've been, uh, they have been also subverted. And we know very well that there were actually supposed to be, whether it was true or not, uh, attempts by Malcolm X's daughter to pay back people within the movement for what she thought they had done to her father. Now, she may be nuts, 
and in the end, Malcolm X's wife was uh, burned to death by uh, uh, his, uh, his, his grandson and so on. And there's a lot of weird stuff that went on, but I don't think it's, I don't think that the secret government in the United States, if it even exists, is all that creative. Look, they can't even get from Fallujah to, uh, to uh, Bakuba, et cetera, without having half their people blown up on the highway. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, if Bush and his people were so, uh, you know, were so clever, they'd have, uh, they'd have been able to find all these people they're supposed to be looking for ages ago. So it doesn't seem to me, or they would have kept the stock market high and not have it collapse, or they would have kept the oil prices low and so on and so forth. So I don't think these people are as all powerful as a lot of the conspiracy people think they are. Uh, again, I have to go to my own experience, and I know it's me holding the class and not you, and I apologize. It's better if you could have the class, and then you could uh, get a your spin, which would be people at the lectern have an advantage. I understand and agree. Reverend Moon, Elijah Muhammad, all these people have an advantage because they stand up and you guys are sitting down. One day you'll have my place and you'll be able to have the control. But I, I, I do, I, I, I have to tell you that I think the situation was 10 times worse in the 60s and 70s than it is now. And I think a lot of people are really just trying to make it look like back in the 60s and 70s because they don't have any other um, model to compare it to. So they're trying to say, oh, today is the same as that. And uh, Look, I, all I can tell you is most of you were not alive as you, older people in the, in the 60s. And, and you don't know how bad it was. You don't have any idea. So all I can tell you is you're living in paradise by comparison. That's all I can tell you. Uh, I think you would agree that the times today are not even remotely similar to what we all went through in the 60s. Not where not doesn't make us heroic. It was so ugly and so bad, you just can't imagine. So that's all I can tell you. And the Vietnam War, let me tell you, was about 500 times worse than what we're seeing in Iraq in terms of the sacrifices and what was going on and so on and so forth. Oh, I would say you know 5,000 times worse, and the casualties were. Uh, uh, proportionally that much more, too. Yes? Oh, and going beyond that, look at what happened in World War II and the number of Oh, well, that's a different kind of war. I wasn't comparing. People think <laughs> Vietnam and Iraq are an unjust war. I don't particularly agree in all cases with them. I was against the Vietnam War from the get-go. I thought it was a stupid war. I thought that is, you don't draw uh, lines in the middle of uh, jungles. You draw lines at the, mid at the edge of oceans if you want to. And uh, the whole thing was stupid. The domino theory was totally stupid. The sacrifice of American soldiers was totally stupid. And that was a totally misguided thing. But World War II is a different sort of thing that I honestly think is a patriotic war. And the casualties um, were huge, as you said. Uh, uh, people can say that Iraq is not a patriotic war. That's an argument. But anyway, I don't want to get into that. Let's, you see, the minute you talk about conspiracies, everyone's antenna go up. Uh, that's why I disagree with Spike Lee. I think all the intimations he does there are not fair because he just makes phone calls, pounding, there's uh, people, but he doesn't really focus in on anything that he can actually prove or, or, or even uh, point to that actually he knows about. It. And he just makes people feel the way you're feeling and others, oh, something something really nasty went on here. And I'm not totally sure about that in the case of Malcolm X. There may have been, and I'm not saying there wasn't, but there may not have been. I'm getting back to Jimmy Baldwin. As far as James Baldwin was concerned, he would not have found Malcolm X a sympathetic person. That's all I'm saying. And uh, he did find Elijah Muhammad a sympathetic person with all his flaws. We don't know what Malcolm X is. I, I was there at that time. I used to listen to Malcolm X speak, and I can tell you this: what he did in his hotel room with whoever he was talking to, he would have been a much tougher operator than Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm X was not a pussycat, and I don't know who he spoke to, who the people he was in contact with. He was one tough guy. Okay. So, uh...
you know, if he couldn't protect himself, I'm quite surprised, frankly. But anyway, that would go according to your theory. He had no chance. I <laughs> think they had no chance. <laughs> okay, let's go on with Jimmy. <laughs> James, as he, people, everyone used to call Jimmy Bowen, but we're calling James. We don't want anyone to get angry at that, on that. So when Elijah spoke, a chorus would arise, 65, yes, that's right. And uh, the white devil was part of this. The white man is the, is the devil. Well, these are things that are calculated, if you like, um, to uh, increase solidarity and so on. But, you know, uh, forget me. I may be a devil. I don't know. You can call me a devil or the person next to you is a devil, et cetera, et cetera. We all do our best, but which may not be good enough in some people's eyes. But let's take Walt Whitman, okay? We've done Walt Whitman. He's long past. I don't think anyone can call him a devil. And this is a very gentle, well-meaning man in all regards, who, as far as the poem we read, uh, bathed and protected the runaway slaves uh, in Ohio to the highest of his uh, abilities. And even if he only imagined it, he encouraged others to do so. So th th this kind of uh, blanket statement, I don't think, is a helps move uh, harmony and understanding and solutions forward. And uh, that's, I think, what James Paul was done. He didn't, you know, with all due respect, he acknowledged the good things that they were doing in terms of social cohesiveness and um, attempting to, um, you know, make people um, stand up for themselves and be responsible and so on family members and parents and so on, and um, you know, things of that kind, but he felt that they just went overboard because James Paul knew that uh, three quarters of the things that happened to him in his life were as a result of white people. You say, well, he's just a person who's been conciliated um, by white people. Well, come on now, Spike Lee, the same thing. Hey, you, if you want to get into races and non-races, and this gentleman and I are obviously having the, the debate here, Spike Lee is uh, the white man's uh, Afro-American movie producer. I mean, he goes to NYU film school, he has, uh, who's the fellow who did Raging Bull? Um, the, this, what's his name? Scorsese, Scorsese, Scorsese. Scorsese's been his mentor and tutor from day one. Scorsese got all of his contracts for him and, and everything um, that he has enjoyed since. So, uh, uh, again, uh, from my own experience, uh, I was a good friend of Melvin Van Peebles, a really close friend in Paris. He got all of his help from uh, the French government, uh, from French uh, scholarships that were encouraging filmmaking and so on. And um, he functioned extremely well in the uh, so-called white, I don't like those expressions, world that I was witnessing at that time and exhibited none of the uh, later uh, orientations that he adopted in the wake of the Black Panther uh, phenomenon and so on that I think he found very useful for promoting what he was trying to do later on. But uh, when I met him, he was a totally assimilated person and uh, not aggressive in any way, form, shape uh, at all, and not, not militant either. He'd been in the, in fact, he had been in the um, American Air Force. I think he was, um, what he told me, he had been um, in SAC, uh, Chief Air Command. I think he'd been a navigator or something like that. He was in Europe on the GI Bill. And he was quite comfortable in so-called white society, if you want to call it that. I don't like to use those words, integrated society. So um, though these people later become champions of this kind of uh, approach because it uh, suits them in a certain community to uh, promote themselves like that, I don't think that that's uh, necessarily how they got started. So anyway, that's neither here nor there. We don't want to under, undercut or any, undermine anything that they have achieve, but um, the white devil thing didn't appeal to Paul. And uh, in that regard, I think he was an honest person. I mean, you, you, you have to be, uh, you have to be, uh, 
you have to be balanced in your evaluation of what the situation is. Anyway, uh, as Elijah Muhammad is presented as talking to him on 66, the so-called American Negro is the only reason Allah permitted the United States to endure so long. The white man's time was up in 1913, but it's the will of Allah that the lost black nation, the black men of this country, be redeemed from the white masses to return to the true faith, which is Islam. Uh, so you can read those things. Uh, what's he really talking about in 1913? I think what he's really talking about is a person called Marcus Garvey, and a back to Africa movement that developed under the, under the um, tutelage of an um, Afro-American leader by the name of Marcus Garvey, who was extremely uh, influential from the time of the First World War to uh, the early ninth, or late 1920s, early 30s. I think, and unfortunately, you would be correct to say that J. Edgar Hoover undermined him and <coughs> destroyed him. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And uh, Edgar Hoover was functioning from the 20s to the to the to the late 60s, and that's a kind of frightening thing. 40 years, uh, kind of an American secret police, if you want to call it that. But what a frightening thing! They shouldn't name a building in Washington after that guy. Uh, you know, he did more to destroy justice in the country than to promote it, and I have no uh, reticence in, in saying that. But um, I'm sure he was involved in the Kennedy assassination. And uh, this is a pretty ugly uh, situation that we had there, uh, which I think is not as ugly today as it, as it used to be. Uh, but anyway, Marcus Garvey is the person that I think um, uh, Elijah Muhammad is taking off from in terms of uh, 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 negritude, blackness, black nationalism, and so on. He was the first really uh, famous black nationalist. I, um, can't go any deeper in a class like this than that, but um, he is mentioning 1913, and I think the reason he is, he is doing that is because of the Marcus Garvey Back to Africa movement. Um, well, I think you can read most of this your, 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 yourself. Um, it's a pretty good um, presentation of Elijah's speech, I think, on page 70 then. Um, I said at last and had to do some other ricocheted question. I left the church 20 years ago. I haven't joined anything since. They're asking him now about him, James Baldwin, because they want to conciliate him and bring him into the movement in some way. Uh, I was a Christian. I was something, uh, I was in something of a bind. Uh, now I don't find these things enough. I'm a writer. I like doing things alone. I don't like to be part of movements. Elijah smiled at me, and he's very polite. Um, uh, I think uh, he ought to think about it. Uh, um, uh, Elijah said it's his right to think like this, but I think he should think some more about it. And um, he realized that uh, I was not ready to join forces with him, basically, is what he said. My weak, deluded scruples could have done nothing against the iron word of the prophet, page 71. I felt that I was back in my father's house when I was in this situation, Baldwin speaking, as I indeed was. I told Elijah that I did not care if white and black people married, and I had many white friends, and I would have no choice if it came to it but to perish with them. So here he is being straight with him. He, he actually has uh, many white friends, as he says, and if the chips were down, he would go down with them rather than have this total separation that Elijah and others were uh, interested in. I love a few people. Uh, oh, I said, anyway, if it came to it, I would perish with them. For, as I said to myself, but not to Elijah, and he didn't say this out right now, I love a few people, they love me, some of them are white, and isn't love more important than color? And uh, whether he said that in those words to Elijah or not, uh, that's what he said. So for a Baldwin, it's what a person is that was important, not slogans. Now, again, slogans may be the correct way to go. I'm not saying that uh, that isn't uh, the way to do a political or a religious movement. But someone like Baldwin, it is not the way to go. So. Uh, what is the way to go? Well, Baldwin is not the leader of a movement or a political um, party. 
But I think he is saying spiritual things that people can relate to if you want to. And I think uh, following someone like Baldwin would matter, would heal up more wounds than what we're seeing here. But that's your own decision. I know there are people in the room here who disagree. Uh, but this is Baldwin, and uh, let's finish him up. Eliza looked at me with great kindness and affection. I don't think Malcolm X would have looked at him with great kindness and affection when he said something like that. Um, he, he does like Elijah. When you uh, read the Chosen book, I hope you will see the comparison of the rabbi in the Chosen book with Elijah. I think it's a, a lot of similarities in terms of the effect he has on his followers. Um, as though he was reading my heart and skeptically said that I might have white friends or think I did and they might be trying to be decent, uh, but their time was now up. Uh, and I certainly had no evidence to give them that would outweigh Elijah's authority. And page 72, yes, I knew two or three people white whom I would trust with my life. And I knew a few others white who were struggling as hard as they knew how and with great effort and sweat and risk to make the world more human. And so on and so forth. So the South Side, however, proved uh, the justice of the indictment. What I was seeing here on the South Side of Chicago, remember I uh, said there's a North Side of Chicago and a South Side? How many have been to the south side of Chicago? Well, I have. And even today, it's um, not a place that is uh, very encouraging in terms of uh, seeing the situation that you often see there. Uh, and uh, I drove around the south side of Chicago. The University of Chicago is on the south side of Chicago. And I had a lot of things to do there. I mean, there's people with bonfires everywhere, big garbage sort of things that are being burned at night on the streets and so on. And an atmosphere that people would find, I think, difficult to cope with. And um, so, as James Baldwin is saying here, uh, you know, this is, this bears out a lot of the indictment. But on a personal level, Baldwin said, I can't go that route. So it's a tough situation. Uh, and it was the same problem he had with his father earlier. So again, these are the things that I hope that you'll be able to wrestle with in, uh, in an essay. Um, let's see. I looked back at the young faces around the table and looked at Elijah, 73. Uh, who was saying no people in history had ever been respected who had not owned their land. And uh, I think that is true. You have to be a, a, a homeowner, you have to be a landowner, you have to be a small business person, you have to be an entrepreneur, entrepreneur in, the, in, the, in the United States in order to gain a modicum of power and respect. It's a capitalist country, fortunately or unfortunately, that's just the way it is. That is, has nothing to do necessarily with race, all races. Koreans, Afro-Americans, Jewish people, Arabs, Anglo-Saxons, Poles, Irish, all have to tell the same thing. Nobody has a free ride on this regard. Capitalism is a struggle. Um, people prefer capitalism in some ways because they prefer to manage their own destiny. Uh, they don't want to be told by governments what they should do. And we've seen the totalitarian governments. We know what totalitarian governments do. And we know that totalitarian governments are not pleasant to live under either. Maybe you get a paycheck every week that allows you to survive, but that's about all you get. <laughs> so uh, most people say, I'd rather take my risk out there in the jungle than uh, have a totalitarian government tell me what I should be doing. So it, 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 that's a philosophical discussion beyond our scope. But given that this is the world we live in, we might as well, I, my view is, we ought to might as well get used to it and make the best because we're not going to change in our but, uh, Unless you're Kate Guevara, as I said. You go see the Motorcycle Diaries, if you like. It's out there now about his early life. He's someone who thought he could change it, but uh, he ended up in Bolivia uh, very badly shot up. And uh, say, well, that's the injustice of the capitalist world. Well, yeah, it is. But that's the world we're going to live in, and unless you want to end up in Bolivia badly shot up, then unfortunately we're going to all be on the phones. Uh, white, black, or any other color in, in between. And um, 
to my mind, that's not a, that's not a negative. I think that, uh, to my mind, as soon as I can tell my children, be an Uncle Tom, this is the way the world is, get on with this because it's not going to change in your lifetime, and probably if it did, it would be worse. So, uh, you know, as good and decent as your impulses for justice and change are, the world is going to continue the way it is. So, since you have a life to lead, all you can do is lead the best that you can within that system. That's what I would tell anyways. <coughs> I was a preacher, but I'm not a preacher, so I'm just carrying on. Elijah's intensity, 74, and I think James Ball and I probably agree on that one. And bitter isolation, disaffection of the young man, and the despair of the streets outside had caused me to glimpse dimly what may now seem to be a fantasy, although in age so fanatical, I would hesitate to say precisely what a fantasy is. Let us say the Muslims were to achieve possession of six or seven states they claim owed to the Blacks by the United States as back payment for slave labor. And you know, a lot of people are asking for reparations now. So you see that that's a black Muslim position even back in the 60s that people are still uh, speaking about. And, uh, but you see, even, uh, even James Baldwin knows it's a fantasy that no one's going to give anyone six or seven states. They're not going to give it to the uh, uh, Hispanic Americans and they're not going to give it to any other American. Uh, you're just going to have to, they're not going to give it to the Native Americans. Just going to have to deal with the, what we have here. And um, a lot of people, you know, it's a funny thing, um, went back to Africa in the wake of many of these situations. And uh, I remember some stories that I heard about all the uh, Black Panther and other groups who were uh, preaching this sort of thing. Uh, Stokely Carmichael, who married Miriam McCabe, the famous uh, South African singer. And many of them went to Ghana, which was one of the first uh, modern uh, new African states back in the middle part of the last century. And there were, um, there were stories about how they all ran and threw their American passports into the ocean to demonstrate their uh, allegiance to the new state of Ghana. And like uh, six weeks later, they were all out there crawling on the sand looking to find their passports. I mean, you can have all the idealism that you want, but when you're faced with a new country with its problems, sometimes the old country that you came from doesn't look half, half bad. And people like Eldridge Cleaver, who was a very uh, famous uh, black, uh, Muslim, uh, black Panther leader, uh, just did a 180 degrees about face uh, after living 10 or 15 years as an exile in different countries in North Africa, Libya, and places like that where he suddenly discovered he was in a much worse situation than in the United States. So um, I think a lot of people, unfortunately, discover that. And um, then people come back and uh, realize the way to do things is um, maybe like um, some of these people like Condoleezza Rice and others. Uh, just get on with it and show your talent to the environment that you are born in. And uh, you probably, with hard work, will find your way through. Okay, um, so here's uh, the end of this. It was time to leave, 78, and we stood in a large living room. I could not help feeling that I had failed the test. Everything was unresolved. They were disappointed. Obviously, they wanted a commitment from him, and uh, there was something wrong. We shook hands, and he asked me where I was going. Wherever I wanted to go, he's very, very, very gentlemanly, Elijah Muhammad is. And I would be driven there because when we invite someone, he says, we take responsibility to protect him from the white devil until he gets where he's going. And I was, in fact, going to have a drink with several white devils on the <laughs> other side of town. And I confess that for a fraction of a second, I hesitated to give the address because it was the kind of address that in Chicago, as in all American cities, <coughs> identified it as a so-called white address, if you want to call it that, by virtue of its location. But I did give it, and Elijah and I walked out in the steps, and one of the young men vanished to get the car, and it was very strange to stand with Elijah for those few moments facing those violent, if problematic, streets. So it's a very good description, don't you think? And that's why this book, I think, is, uh, will endure. Uh, yet precisely because of the reality and nature of those streets, because of what he conceived as his responsibility, and what I took to be mine, we would always be strangers, and possibly one day enemies. The car arrived, a gleaming, metallic, grossly American blue, and Elijah and I shook hands, said goodnight once more, 
He walked into his mansion and shut the door. And the driver and I started on our way. Uh, at this hour, strangely beautiful Chicago along the lake. Here we were, Negro. How were we Negroes to get this land? I asked this of the dark boy who had said earlier at the table that the white man's actions proved him to be the devil. So they have this uh, very philosophical discussion in the car, he and the um, driver and so on. Uh, page 82, he starts talking about Malcolm X again. I have to bring my presentation of this to a close because time demands that we move on. I would love to read all the pages of it to you because often I worry about whether you actually um, read things carefully yourselves and pick out, I'm not doing a great job, I admit, the pith of it, but in any case, uh, I leave it to you to read the rest yourself. Yeah. Captain, yeah, I was reading this book. I think uh, he, he, he's taking the, the, the white devil into a specific he is. Of tense. Or or he is. Not, he is. He is. And I, I look at it, it's like, uh, I don't think you can label one group of people like that. But then at the same time, I think I understand that when you, when you talk about, you, you look back at the genocide against the Native Americans. You look at the triangular slave trade, you look at the chattel slave system, you look at colonialism. It was all led by white men, you know, and all that thing. I would, I would think of that as, as deadly. Well, I just want to ask you if you think black men were white men and in the same in the position of scientific power that they had. These just have to do with the technological advancement. That's the only thing that gives one group an advantage over the other is technology. If the situation were reversed, you think that you would have had a different behavior pattern? Yes, I do. I, I don't but think I, so. I think I, I just, mankind I, I just think is in, basically... In that, uh, in that context, and making those statements, I can understand that, even though I don't believe it to be true. Mm -hmm. And I think that to overspecify it, as every white person would be a white devil, I, I don't think that's true. Well, from obviously the they are. We know that. Right. They, they, don't, they don't mean to be devils. If they are devils, uh, some of them are, some of them aren't. There are black devils, white devils, and... There's evil uh, people across the border. We'll, we'll, say, we'll say people were all Christian people. That doesn't... I'm, I'm just saying it's not, it's not a, an answer to your life. I have to, uh, let me just uh, correct one thing that I agree with some of the things that Stella was saying, but I don't think, I think people basically behave the same everywhere. Uh, if a one person has a power of advantage over another person, they often destroy them. It takes a lot of, um, um, how do you say, um, trying to hold back from exercising your power not to do this. For instance, I don't think the pioneers who went across America really wanted to destroy all the Native Americans there. Uh, but the force of their, uh, of their numbers and what was uh, propelling them forward just overwhelmed all anything that stood in their way. And you don't think so. I give the, I give the pioneers a lot of credit for uh, at least having goodwill. Uh, but when they were um, faced with a situation that they perceived maybe it wasn't true, that people were being uh, unnecessarily aggressive and murderous towards them, then their murderousness came out and they responded doubly in kind. Let's say one caused the other. It's just that even in Africa today, you look what happened in Burundi and Rwanda, when one group gets power over another, they don't just go wipe each other out. In the Sudan now, what is going on there? I mean, it is a pathetic situation. They say, all oh, that's being caused by whitey. No, I don't think so. I don't think it's all being caused by Now, the last point I want to make there about the people who went through their passports in Ghana and then went and grabbed them back. Um, um, <clears throat> Well, I can't remember the point I was going to make because it, 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 it was a good point, but anyway. Well, the point I wanted to say was, you know, you, you quickly are dismissive of... I'm not trying to be dismissive, I'm, I'm trying just, to be I'm there. Just, let me just say what I want to say. Right. <laughs> I'm a student, I pay my tuition. Why? Well, hey, everybody, and there are 65 students in this class, so we give them all... Everybody can speak if they want, I mean. But what I wanted no, to say was, class has to go you, were, you were, when you, you, you talked about, after you, you talked about such an uncivilized manner in, in, in such a horrible place and found out it was worse than it was in America. What? I'm just I said something was worse than America? Well, no, you said that, oh, they went there and they, they, they were trying to get their passports and leave and people came back and they came well, back. Well, that's what happened, yeah. But uh, I'm just saying, you make those statements, you fail to recognize that this is, 
the uh, post-colonial uh, Africa. The Africa is the way it is because of colonialism. Well, well, that was the point I was going to make. Uh, even I though the Europeans, mean, even though the Europeans were responsible for the slave trade, it was part of their economic game that they were playing. You know, taking. I mean, they subjugated it. To okay, but who world. sold the who sold the people to the Europeans? Uh, yeah, my family in, in Nigeria was part of that. Yeah, so we, people, didn't know, I mean, we didn't know we were selling to the chattel slave system. Oh, uh, come on. It was not the same. Was well, not why the same were you taking exactly. prisoners and going to the coast and selling them? It, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was selling and it was taking. It's not only just selling. All I'm it, trying it, to it, say, and I don't say anything's horrible I, or worse, I think, again, I dislike the fact that my words, which I try to be balanced in the, the kinds of things I'm saying, are twisted and only the worst spin. Well, they, uh, take you, it from them. You, you're not being balanced. You, what you were saying, like, oh, look, we'll be on. Well, you think this is balanced? No. <laughs> <laughs> you think Malcolm X is balanced? I'm trying to be. Look, all I'm trying to say is that human beings in a power situation, the stronger often behaves badly. Do you think the Romans were kind to their colonies? Huh? Oh, uh, no. Power makes people behave in an oppressive way. I don't necessarily think it corrupt. I don't think Romans thought they were corrupt. I don't like those. But I, I think that any people who has an advantage population-wise, technological-wise, and every otherwise over another people is uh, often going to behave in um, overwhelming manner. Since this class was on religion and not politics, yeah. could I say something? Sure, go ahead. I, it seems to me <laughs> what, we're, what we're given here to look at when we're looking at James Baldwin and Malcolm X is two different ways of individuals reacting to the, the pressures and oppressions that they felt. And I, and I think that that's probably the thing, or that is the thing that I get when I think of Malcolm X or James Baldwin. Both these people came from the same oppression, at, at least the way they perceived it. Both of them went to the same churches and both of them had their own ways of coming out of, of both of those types of bottles into the world. Uh, Malcolm X had one way and, and James Baldwin had another. And, and I think in this class, uh, as when we did the, uh, the class on the native religions, but that's what we're looking at is the spiritual uh, coming out, the spiritual ways of, of facing the society they're facing. Well, I mean, finish up here because regardless of what you say, you're paying your tuition and ever you have a right, yeah, sure you have a right to speak, but we can't hold the class back because you have uh, more than you want to say because if everybody in a classroom had, uh, you know, a huge amount to say, no classes would ever get taught. No, 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 I agree with that. I want you to say, I want you to understand that I didn't have to assign these things to the class. I don't have to show the Malcolm X movie. I don't have to read James Baldwin. I could actually just flush the whole thing and do something simple without getting into these deep things. I feel it's I important. It's I think it's important. My only feeling is that since I was doing this, I felt an obligation as a parent, as a teacher, as an older person, to try to cheer people up, too. I don't, I don't like people who think the world is told so totally stacked against them. And I have, a, I have an obligation, it seems to me, if I'm going to throw this material out, to at least try to say, hey, look now, you know, you can, you can make it in this world. That's all I was, that's all I always thought I was trying to say. And it doesn't matter what I'm doing. Okay yeah, I am an Uncle Tom. You're looking at one. No, I'm just saying you're promoting that, but you're Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I am an Uncle Tom. <laughs> I am Uncle Tom. My great grandparents had beards down here and side locks and all other kinds of things and probably went uh, and walked around, you know, uh, praying all the time like this and so on. And I am an Uncle Tom, you know, and frankly, I am saying if you want to get along in capitalism, you better be one. And I don't think it's bad. I think Uncle Tom was a great novel. And a great civil war. And I think that the black national movement was wrong to condemn people trying to get along in the American society. Because they made people dissatisfied and they made the situation in fact worse. Because people were doing better before that than they that's my perception of what happened in this country. In the in the black community it became are, are, are worse off in many ways than they were 30 or 40 years ago, 
because they had a, a social structure. No, wait, no. A social structure that worked. That a social structure that was operative 30, 40 years ago. I mean, That's what I'm saying. Not that the economics <coughs> is, 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 is better today, but I am saying that the fact that people back at then were taking American society as it was and then trying to move forward within American society actually uh, produced better effect on the young people than rap. That's, uh, that's, that's my personal approach. I'm in wrong. Yeah, like me, you're not an expert on the area. I'm not an expert on the area. You think rap is a better thing, for instance, than Uncle Tom? Yeah. yeah. I think conscientious hip hop. Right? You think that rap, in fact, in fact, is going to make people have a successful, happy life more than the other approach? It, it can't have that effect. You're looking at a blanket system. No, well, of course we're talking in generality. We're talking to Look, uh, you're forcing me to say things that I really don't want to say. You're <laughs> to say. Uh, my, all I can say to you guys, I apologize to you if I hurt your feelings. All I'm trying to say is that my thing is try to move ahead in your life. That's all that I, if you have to be on the phone to do it, you're looking at it. And I would tell my own kids the same thing. And if I were your dad, I'd tell you the same thing. Glad you know. you're not. <laughs> <laughs> you could do worse. <laughs> yeah. I believe that dads should help their uh, their uh, children as much as they possibly can and prepare them to deal with the world that they have to face. And uh, that's an obligation I think every father and mother has to their children and not fill them with ideas that in fact will down against them and cause them not to be able to deal with the world. Yeah, that's, let's see what James Baldwin finally says. 104. When I was young, we're dealing with my buddies in the wine year and in the hallway, something made me wonder, what will happen to all that beauty? And I agree with him, that's so there is beauty. For black people, and Walt Whitman said that too, for black people, though I'm aware that some of us black and white do not know it, are very beautiful. And when I sat at Elijah's table and watched the baby, the women, the men, and we talked about God or Allah's vengeance, I wondered, when that vengeance was achieved, what will happen to all that beauty? Will things get better after all that vengeance and, 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 and negativism? What will happen to all that beauty then? I can also see the intransigence and ignorance of the white world might make that vengeance inevitable, a vengeance that does not really depend on and cannot really be executed by any person or organization. Historical vengeance is a cosmic vengeance based on the law that we recognize when we say whatever goes up must come down. And here we are at the center of the ark, trapped in the gaudiest, most valuable, most improbable water wheel the world has ever seen, meaning America. Everything now we must assume is in our hands. We have no right to assume otherwise. And if we, and now I mean the relatively conscious whites and the relatively conscious blacks who must, like lovers, insist on or create the consciousness of the others, do not falter in our duty now. We may be able, handful that we are, to end this racial nightmare and achieve our country and change the history of the world. If we do not dare everything, the fulfillment of that prophecy recreated from the Bible is a song by a slave is upon us. God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water or the fire next time. So basically that's what this book's name But What is he finally saying? Um, uh, well, to my mind, he's saying what I'm trying to say, but maybe I haven't said it as eloquently as his. Maybe you feel that his approach is uh, not a possible uh, approach and there's a better way. I don't know. What do you think uh, about his final statement? I, not, I, I think you know, you know, ultimately you want to get to a place where it's, you, know, you can have a race neutrality, everybody can love everybody. But you can't get there until you acknowledge and you, you overcome how things got to be where they're at in the first place. And, uh, you know, it's you got to have apologies. You got to have some type of reparation. You can't. You can't just ignore what happened. You know, the, you can't ignore the Ku Klux Klan. You can't ignore lynching. You can't ignore, you know, the slave trade, the chattel slavery system. You know, you can't ignore all that and then go on and say, oh, let's love each other. You know, you got to be able to build yourself up internally as an internal community before you can go out and do that. You need to have healing. You need to be on both sides. You need to recognize what happened. I don't think that's what he was saying at all. Well, he's asking what I feel. Well, I know you're hearing, you hear an odd thing coming from me, that's all I can tell you. Uh, all I'm saying is that we're living in capitalism, we better try to make the best of it, whoever we are, but I'm not making a statement about whether slave trade uh, should have not been apologized for, or reparation, or whatever else. I have told you from the beginning here that I think that this country went wrong with the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Reconstruction would have been done much more effectively, it set the country back a hundred years. I think Walt Whitman's poem about uh, Lincoln was absolutely right. 
Uh, I think this country shed a lot of blood over the Afro-American issue, uh, more blood probably than any other country would have ever done. And, uh, you know, I think you had uh, 500,000 people blown away in a civil war relating to it. And uh, the uh, Ku Klux Klan is certainly something that almost all people in this country were uh, horrified by and against. It was part of the uh, continuation of the struggle by the South in an underground guerrilla fashion to keep on the society that they wanted. And with the assassination of Lincoln and so on, the political forces in the North were not strong enough to suppress it. The same as what's going to happen in Iraq now, the blowing up of people, etc. The American forces are not going to be strong enough to suppress what is going on there. And we were set back 100 years. So we all acknowledge the past, but it doesn't do any good to just sit there and grind one, one's wheels over it. And uh, when we get into Black Elk, we'll see he's got a bigger problem. Uh, his people were all killed. <laughs> Anyway, I go think, ahead. You know, when it comes from from within, we can't look at you know all of the country, you know, because I mean now every you know Mexicans, Native Americans, they can all say you know this country was something, but you just gotta let it go. You know, when it comes from within, and you know, I don't think uh, like he's saying you shouldn't let it go in your inner consciousness, but you shouldn't let it hold you back. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't think people can love each other ultimately. They can just treat each other decently. And um, uh, uh, with respect, and uh, look, you're not going to get um, people from Polish background to like people from German background, and so on and so forth. After all the water that's gone over the dam, forget the black and the white and all these other problems. I mean, most people don't like each other uh, across the world. Uh, just take a look. Germans don't like French people. English don't like French people. Um, uh, Amer Mexicans don't like Americans. Canadians don't like uh, Americans. Uh, Koreans don't like Japanese. Japanese don't like Koreans. Uh, and, you know, um, all you have to do is be someone's neighbor to get to dislike that person. <laughs> Often the only people that you end up liking are people that you don't know. And it's just the, I'm just, it's the way people are. I, I, I'm not trying to idealize people. Uh, Persians don't like Arabs. Turks hate Persians. Uh, I've been to all these countries, I can tell you. Greeks don't like Yugoslavs. <coughs> Albanians hate Serbs. Uh, you know, I, I forget the, the, the problem we're talking about. And I think it's unrealistic not to recognize, you could go to Africa and I'm sure you'll find the same things going on. One community against another all across that whole continent, not always um, the result of colonial interference. But whenever you want to get into colonial things, the worst colonial powers were the Europeans. And they get off scot free in this. Well, I don't see anyone blaming them for anything. People who caused the mess in the United States as far as uh, Southwestern thing and the uh, Mexican and are the Spanish. And who goes around saying the Spanish are the devil people? I mean, look, I, I just think that, you know, there should be some balance in the criticism of this country which we all live in and we all want to make a better place. That's my, that's my thing and I don't think it pays off to always wash all our dirty linen for everyone all over the world to make us look like we're a bunch of, of losers when I think we actually are doing the best that a lot of people can do. Um, let's go Black Elk. Uh, Black Elk is a very colorful guy. I spent a lot more time on, uh, on James Baldwin than I really uh, felt we could. Uh, it's my fault for getting involved in these issues with you guys and <coughs> giving my big mouth. Uh, I could just read him and just go on and let him say what he wants and then uh, skip it. But uh, to my mind, it's best to try to, you know, help people either for or against get through it. Black Elk is a straightforward situation. Black Elk is nothing but suffering. And, uh, <laughs> you know, but I have to say this about Black Elk. He's a very endearing person. I mean, by the time you finish reading Black Elk, you really love this guy. Uh, you say, well, he's an Uncle Tom. Uh, well, uh, maybe he is an Uncle Tom, although he does take up uh, weapons against the American forces at the end uh, in the, um, in the, um, in the uh, wounded knee situation. Uh, when uh, the ghost dance is going on among the Native Americans, you may not know that situation back in 18, end of 1880, beginning of 1890, 
of the last gasp of the uh, Plains Indians resistance to the U.S. government. And by the way, there were black troops that helped put that down. Uh, they were the troops, in fact, that the, that the, uh, they were the troops that the Native Americans uh, feared, feared the most, the so-called Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, I say, well, they were just uh, being used by the American government. Yeah, I don't say they weren't, but they were there. And uh, they were involved in that, and they were some of the troops that were the most uh, frightened, that the Native Americans were most frightened of. Uh, as uh, I think the black units in the American Army have proved to be extremely uh, um, effective soldiers. So, um, as we're seeing today in, uh, in Iraq. So, for good or for bad, that's a fact of, of life. And, a certain kind of honor involved in that too. It's not all the opposite. In any case, um, Black Elk does take up arms against the U.S. government, and he does ride into the situation, and uh, he believes that he can't be wounded, he believes he can't be killed, and I forgot, I think he is uh, either wounded or knocked off his horse, but it's almost a Don Quixote-like episode towards the end of this book. Now, Black Elk is a Native American shaman, uh, I think, in fact, that uh, Carlos Castaneda really takes almost everything that he's trying to present himself as from this Joseph Neidhart uh, person here, who uh, takes down the conversations of Black Elk in the 1930s or 40s, I think, and made this book. One of the problems we have here, I think, is how much of this really is Black Elk and how much of this is Joseph Nyhart? Uh, Joseph Nyhart is the editor, and he was a, a novelist himself. And it was in the Depression period when um, the Roosevelt administration was paying people to do cultural pro projects to keep them, uh, keep them, you know, working and active. And there was government money to do this kind of thing. And uh, uh, Nyhart went on to the uh, so-called Indian reservations and um, got in contact with Black Elk, who uh, knew the whole story of what had happened to the Native Americans from his tribal area, and had experienced much of it himself, and took it all down before he died. Now, your version of Black Elk, they keep reprinting new ones, so we have to buy new ones with different pages. But we have some of the paintings of Black Elk's uh, people in this. I think Black Elk did some of the paintings that we have here. And we have some pictures also, so the, the, the paintings have been added. I don't have the paintings, but in fact, there's a picture of Black Elk here as a young man. If you look here, um, I think he's on the left there. There's a picture of Joseph Nyhart. There's a picture of Joseph Nyhart with Black Elk, some of Black Elk's friends, um, as he appeared later. And here's uh, Black Elk and Joseph Nyhart when they're old men. Uh, so, and uh, here's the, the Joseph Nyhart uh, with Black Elk's the drum that he gave him uh, in, later, in, in later life. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that I think we're going to have to decide here is uh, um, how much of this we can rely on, the same as Carlos Castaneda. Now, the beautiful thing about Black Elk is that he, he, he lives through the Custer thing. He was a young boy, about 13 years old, so you can then date him when the Custer massacre occurred. He was on the battlefield. He uh, was uh, protecting his family from the Custer's troops. And, but later he rode around the battlefield and saw the dead soldiers and all that sort of thing. Uh, he was a uh, relative, distant relative of Crazy Horse. Uh, he knew Crazy Horse, um, he tells you about Crazy Horse's uh, death at the hands of soldiers, American soldiers, uh, Native American Indian um, reservation soldiers who were combined. He knows about Sitting Bull's death, he knows all of these people, but he's also a religious person himself. He's a totally religious person, and this is, a, I think, um, whether it's Nyhart or Black Elk or the combination of the two of them, it's a great book. And um, there's no book that has been produced in Native American culture like it previously, and no book likely to be produced after it as good as or as interesting as this. Uh, and in fact, many Native Americans, or Indians as they used to be called, depending on how you want to refer to these things, which language you want to use, 
I'll keep it on 9.15 today because of our uh, discussion to held us back from moving ahead here, and uh, I want to get moving a little bit quicker here. Um, the, the, uh, the picture here that one gets uh, from Black Elk is a totally authentic picture, and uh, Black Elk is, aside from all the political things, as I said, he knew Buffalo Bill. He went to Europe as part of Buffalo Bill's uh, Native American Indian show and so on. He met Queen Victoria. He really got around. But he ended up going back to the reservation, or the res, as people like to call it today, and uh, seeing the depression and, and the bad situation on the reservation, he's not afraid to talk about it. But he wants Nyhart to, uh, he wants Nyhart to put down his visions and his uh, view of things. And in fact, when Nyhart comes to him, as we'll see, he actually tells Nyhart that he saw him coming, that he knew he was going to come. Something like Castaneda says, uh, um, what's his name? Uh, what's the name of Castaneda's uh, guru? What? Don Juan. I don't think Don Juan measures up to Black Elk as a, uh, as a guru, as a spiritual te teacher. A few more words of Black Elk before we depart. The funny thing about Black Elk is, not only is he a shaman or a medicine man, and he claims, as I said, to be related to people like uh, Crazy Horse, and he tells us all about Crazy Horse, and also his funeral and so on. He is a, um, he's a choreographer. Today, if he were functioning in the big American world, he'd probably be in Hollywood, organizing, you know, musicals in the Hollywood big screen. Because what he liked to do most of all was organize dances. He used to create and choreograph Indian or Native American dances. And he gives you all the dances that he choreographed and that he, uh, that he, that he created. <coughs> and he would create these dances out of his visions. Uh, he had these visions, and he talks about the earliest vision he has, which he has when he's about, like, I think he's about 10 years old. And it's a vision that he never forgets. Lacey claims to have never forgotten it. It's a horse vision, and later on, when he's trying to to to, to revive the spirit of the of the oppressed and depressed nation, he puts this vision into action as the horse dance, and uh, he describes the whole horse dance that he creates, and so on and so forth. So he's actually a very uh, colorful character, and I think a uh, few people in the arts dance and film and other things, you'll find, uh, and music, you'll find uh, Black Elk a uh, very sympathetic character. Now, a last point about his visions and uh, what he, uh, how he creates and develops these visions and how he puts them into uh, practice, which is what we're interested in to some extent in this class, as well as the history, is he describes to you the Sundance. And as I told you, many Native Americans have had to go back to Black Elk to find out what their customs really were. Because the customs have been so obliterated and forgotten that it's books like Black Elk that bring people back in touch with their, uh, with their uh, ancestral past. And Black Elk describes for you the Sundance. And that is really one of the most incredible uh, descriptions that you can imagine. In particular, he describes Sitting Bull's Sundance that Sitting Bull has before Custer comes and attacks the Native American Indian encampment um, at the Little Bighorn. And why Sitting Bull knows that Custer is coming and why Sitting Bull knows that the U.S. Cavalry is going to fall into their hands because he has the vision in this, uh, in this uh, Sundance. What is a Sundance? Anyone here know what a Sundance is? Well, uh, you'll read about it, but what it involves is young Native American Indian uh, people cutting the muscles under their chests and uh, putting uh, thongs through their uh, chests and then uh, tying themselves to a pole, and, uh, like a maypole, and then circling around this maypole and leaning back on their thongs and continuing this excruciating process all 
day long in the sun, which is why it's called a sun dance, until ultimately they rip the muscles of their chest. And at that moment of excruciating pain, a vision is supposed to occur. And this is part of um, growing up, and this is what a lot of uh, young Native Americans are still interested in doing today, and it's an incredible description. So I'm trying to encourage you to read this book. So you got the weekend. Start reading this book. And I'm just on. Ed, anybody feeling that I have unwittingly harmed because of my openness? It was not my intention to hurt you.